Working with dead bodies may seem a little different or weird to some people, especially if you're new to our channel. But the donated bodies that are in our anatomy lab have taught millions of people about the amazing machine that is the human body. Now, one of the most common questions we get from students is, how long do the bodies last? Or how long can they stay in the lab for? Months? A year? Two years? Well, in today's video, we're gonna focus on the human body that has been in our lab the longest and so therefore has taught more people than any of the other bodies. How long do you think that is? I'll obviously answer that question, but I'm gonna answer it a little bit differently by talking about how this particular body is not only our oldest, but also our youngest. We're also gonna show you the cause of death, which was a certain type of cancer, as well as talk about some of the mysteries or surprises that we didn't expect to find when we first started to look inside this body. It's gonna be a memorable one, so let's do this. So here is this amazing body that has been in our lab the longest. And yes, we will open up the bag in a second, but let's just finally get to this answer of how long has this body been here? Well, this body has been in our lab for nearly 10 years. Think about that, how amazing that is. How many students have been able to come through our lab? How many students have been able to view this body and learn from it on our online platforms? This body has truly reached and educated millions of people. Now, obviously our bodies have to be fixed or embalmed, some sort of preservation process to last this long, and we obviously continue to preserve and care for the bodies. But I did also mention that this body is our oldest, but also our youngest. And what I mean by that is, yes, it's been in our lab the longest, but this body died in his mid-60s. Or the majority of our other bodies throughout the lab died in their late 70s, early 80s. We actually have one body that she died in her mid-90s, so that's quite remarkable in and of itself. But we have a ton of gratitude for those who donate their bodies to science. We couldn't educate people in the same way without these donations. Yes, there are a lot of cool pictures and anatomical software, 3D, people are even moving into augmented reality, but nothing replaces actually seeing the real thing. And speaking of the real thing, let's take a look at some of these mysteries or surprises that we found when working with this body. So let's first start by taking a look inside the abdominal cavity to talk about some of those little surprises as well as some of the expected abnormalities. Because when we first bring a body into the lab, yes, we get the age and the cause of death. And based on the cause of death, there are certain abnormalities that we should expect to find. But we don't get the entire health history of the person. And so there are a few surprises that we come across. One of those is when I was actually removing the abdominal body wall to get into the cavity. And what I didn't expect to find, or at least to see, is I didn't expect to see this much of the small intestine first. And you might think, well, why wouldn't you expect to see the small intestine in the abdominal cavity? And that's because normally when you first remove the abdominal body wall, you first see this fatty apron that's covering the majority of the small intestine. And that fatty apron is known as the greater omentum. And all this body had was this really thin and frail, you can even see holes in it, this smaller, thin greater omentum, I guess not so great, and it was shifted over to the left side, definitely not covering up the majority of the small intestine. Now, if you haven't seen a normal greater omentum, seeing this normal greater omentum will help this sink in a little deeper. You can see how much thicker and fattier it is, definitely covering up the majority of the small intestine. Now, this can vary in thickness based on adipose or fat content. So as a person increases their adipose or fatty content, the greater omentum can get thicker as it is a storage facility for fat, but we haven't seen one this thin before. And one of the other cool things about the greater omentum is it contains lymph nodes and white blood cells. So that means it can help fight off and contain infections within the abdominal cavity. Now, another thing that was a little bit of a surprise, not a huge shocker, but hey, we did expect to see a gallbladder when I lifted up the liver here, but the gallbladder was not there, and so this particular person had their gallbladder removed while they were still alive, which is called a cholecystectomy. Now, the gallbladder is a little sac that stores bile that's produced by the liver. Bile is important for breaking down or emulsifying fats during the digestive process, but you can live without a gallbladder because, as I said, the liver is what produces the bile, so that bile can still get to the digestive tract. You just don't get to store extra bile in that gallbladder for really, really fatty meals. So let's talk about cause of death with this body. Cause of death was colorectal cancer that metastasized to the liver. That is cancer within the rectum here, moving into the sigmoid colon, and eventually some of those cancer cells would make it into the bloodstream 
and spread or metastasize to the liver. Now we'll compare this liver to a healthy liver in just a second, but first I want to take a minute to talk about the importance of digestive health as well as digestive health screenings. Because colon cancer is actually pretty treatable if you catch it early. Say like through a routine screening like a colonoscopy, they were to find concerning lesions or precancerous lesions, they could deal with that prior to those cancer cells making it into the bloodstream and spreading somewhere like the liver where they could cause a bigger problem and potentially death. Now with overall digestive system health, obviously diet's gonna play a major role, particularly fiber when it comes to the health of the colon and reducing certain risk factors. And we continue to get more and more interesting information when it comes to the microbiome influencing our health. That microbiome being the bacteria or the microorganisms that reside in our gut. So back to this discussion of the cancer spreading to the liver. And I do wanna mention the greater momentum one more time because based on the cause of death, we probably shouldn't have been as surprised by its appearance. This being a digestive system cancer, and oftentimes when people are undergoing cancer treatment, they can lose a lot of weight. And they can lose that weight in the form of losing adipose tissue or fatty tissue, so that can explain why this thinned out, and even why it shifted over to this left side, because the cancer affected more of the left side of the colon here. Now, we did imply earlier that when the cancer spread to the liver, that created a whole other level of problems because the liver is so vital and performs so many important functions for the human body. And if you look at this liver, often when our students first see it, they're like, this thing is huge. And it is huge. It is the second largest organ in the body when it's normal, but this is also an enlarged liver because of the disease state. And if you look closely at the surface, you can see some nodules likely due to the cancer cells spreading into that liver. Now when you compare it to a healthy liver, that healthy liver is smaller, and if you look at the surface, it's more smooth and uniform. So let's take a look at another little surprise finding that we observed in this cadaver, and that was in the sigmoid colon. And if you take a look at this sigmoid colon, there's these little out pouchings that you can see here, here, and even two more there and there. Now these little fatty appendages, those are normal and all of us have those, but these little out pouchings are called diverticula and they're a little outpouching of the wall of this large intestine here. Now, you might be wondering, is that linked to his colon cancer because this is in his sigmoid colon? And not necessarily. People have diverticula without having colorectal cancer. And many people don't even know that they have them because they don't develop any symptoms. But let's say poop or feces gets clogged in here with other debris and they get inflamed or infected then it can cause symptoms like lower abdominal pain and even things like fever and chills. Now, these will often get treated by sometimes just observing and see if the, seeing if the body gets over it. Then sometimes they'll even step up to antibiotics. And in extreme cases, they might even consider surgical resection, or in other words, removing a segment that includes those diverticula. Now, another little mystery we found in this body was on the back side of the lower leg. So you're looking at a posterior view of the lower legs here, or the term for lower leg in anatomy is crust, or you often just probably refer to it as the calf. But you can see we've got this muscle called the gastrocnemius here and the associated amazing Achilles tendon on both sides. And obviously on this side you can see we kept some more skin and some of this fascial tissue which I'll mention in just a second. But if you look closely here, there's a clear distinction between the tendon and the muscle. So this musculotendinous junction, clear distinction here, here, muscle, tendon. But if you come to the other side, pretty good on that lateral belly over here on the left side, but when you get to the medial belly, if you notice, that medial belly of the gastroc is scrunched upward when compared to the other side, and if you look closely at that tissue, it's kind of bleh, because bleh is a technical term, and what bleh really means is that was actually scar tissue. Now, that scar tissue likely came from a partially torn Achilles tendon that we didn't expect to find. Now, you may not be appreciating it as much as I was when I was doing the dissection, because normally when you remove fascia from over the top of the tendon, it's pretty easy to peel that apart. There might be some few myofascial adhesions that you have to work apart, but when I got to right here, that fascia was completely fused to the tendon. Now, fascia is designed to wrap and contain a group of muscles, but still allow for them to slide and glide. So if this hand is like the fascia and this hand's the muscle, we'd want that muscle to still be able to slide and glide under the fascia, under the fascia during its different phases of contraction. But on this leg, the fascia being fused, every time this person contracted their muscles and got up on their tippy toes, it tugged and yanked on that fascia rather than that nice loosey-goosey sliding and gliding. So it likely gave a sensation of tightness 
and may have even decreased some of his range of motion. As some of you may know, we launched the Institute of Human Anatomy back in 2012, and it's been an amazing journey every step of the way. We've taught millions of people through our videos and are looking forward to educating even more about the wonders of the human body. I'm so personally grateful for every comment, share, and view from our audience, and the worldwide support is truly mind-blowing. We would not be able to keep creating if it weren't for all of you. Back in July, you may have also known that we launched an anatomy app. It's been an incredible few months of testing and taking feedback from our users inside the community. So now I'm thrilled to announce the relaunch of the Institute of Human Anatomy membership community app with new pricing and new features. We believe we've created something truly special. In this revamped app, you'll find monthly live sessions where we dive deep into different body systems, access to me 24 seven with our new AI assistant to answer all of your burning anatomy questions anytime, over 140 comprehensive study guides and quizzes, monthly Ask Me Anything live streams, where I'll get to answer your burning questions in real time, special interest groups designed for healthcare professionals, fitness enthusiasts, students, educators, and just regular old anatomy nerds. And lastly, a structured learning path to keep you engaged and learning. So whether you're looking to enhance your professional skills, ace your anatomy class, chat with anatomy nerds like you, or simply satisfy your curiosity about the human body, this app is definitely for you. So join us today in our incredible community by checking out the link in the description below. We have new pricing that you don't wanna miss. Thank you again for all of your support. I'm so excited for you to check out our community where there's no limit to this anatomical awesomeness.